Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Bonnie Rose and it is great to see you here this morning. We're going to start our Sunday morning service by standing up and singing together our congregational song, which is called It's in Every One of Us. So let us rest in that gentle shower of blessings that Kim spoke of so sweetly. Allow any residual hardness around our heart to soften. And we listen to the words of our sacred reading. From the top 10 things dead people want you to know by Mike Dooley. Time, space, and matter are an illusion. There is a realm where neither time nor space exists. In this realm, you find awareness. Awareness is some variety of thought. Thoughts become things. You are of this pre-time space matter awareness. You are pure God. You chose to be here. You wanted to forget who you were so you could fully be who you are. You are now who you most wanted to be and you know exactly what you are doing. Love and happiness is why we're here. So remembering that we come from this place, which is not really a place, we come from pure awareness. Let us rest in that and remember as we sing together, I am remembering. I am love, I am hope, I am peace, I am abundance, I am generosity. I am pure awareness. Let us bring that awareness into our open-eyed state as we breathe in deeply. And then exhale, opening our eyes in love with what is, as it is, and so it is. Keep clear before me the moments of my high resolve When the dust and grit of the journey seem to keep me just a little too involved In the things I fear I'm missing and the questions I can't solve Keep me pressing on, Lord, keep me pressing on Unearthing these blocks of fear That for whatever reason they seem so big And all the pretty people that you place before me Wanna grab a shovel and help me dig Now I don't always wanna thank them Wish they'd find another gig Still I keep pressing on, Lord Keep me pressing on Keep clear before me all the moments when I known the truth, when I knew I held your power within me and never had to ask for proof. Grant me the courage to remember who I am and the wisdom to forgive myself if I should miss the mark and need to try again. Keep clear 
before me The moments of my high resolve Like the gentle seeds of clarity That lie within me waiting to evolve And the fears born in the darkness In the daylight they dissolve Keep me pressing on, Lord Keep me pressing on Turbulent waters flow upon the riverbed of my existence as I move forward to the sea. And rather than clinging to the rocks of doubt and my resistance, I let the waters carry me. Let them carry. Keep clear before me the moments of my high resolve When the dust and grit of the journey seem to keep me just a little too involved In the things I fear I'm missing and the questions I can't solve Keep me pressing on, Lord, keep me pressing on Pressing on, Lord, keep me pressing on. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Why don't you talk and I'll listen? Is that <laughs> There's a thought. Now, I'm, I'm going to start this morning by telling you a story. It's from a children's book. Uh, it's by Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote Conversations with God. Probably a lot of you are familiar with his work. And this, is, this uh, book is called Little Soul. And uh, we, we carry it in our bookstore. And how many of you have read Little Soul in the Sun? So quite a few of you. I'm going to tell my version of it, which is probably slightly different, but it's, um, but it's, it's a paraphrased version of that story. So there was this little being named Little Soul, and he was in a realm that we might call heaven or pure awareness or whatever names we want to call for that place that isn't really a place. And he was just wandering around, minding his own business, and one day he discovered, I am light and I am love. And he said, wow. That is an amazing discovery. But you know what? It's not enough just to know it. I want to experience it. And so he had remembered from the dark recesses of his memory that there is this place called planet Earth where energy gets to be experienced as something real. So he said, oh, that's it. I'm going to go to that place called planet Earth. And while I'm there learning about experiencing light and love, I think the best way for me to learn about this is to learn the practice of forgiveness. So he said, I am determined. I am going to go to planet Earth to learn about forgiveness. And so he packed his bags, and he took off his little halo, and he got ready to go. He stood at the threshold, ready to cross over into the new dimension called planet Earth. And all of a sudden, he felt a little tap on his shoulder, and it was one of his angel friends. The second angel said to him, little soul, I hear you are going to planet Earth to learn all about forgiveness. And, and little soul said, yes, yes, I am. The angel said, well, if you go to planet Earth to go to forgiveness, you're going to need someone or something to forgive. <laughs> little soul, soul said, oh my goodness, you're, you're absolutely right. Let's think about this. And so, so the two angels put their heads together and they thought and they thought and they thought. And finally, the second angel said, aha, I have a plan. I will go to planet Earth with you and I will be mean to you and I will be unkind to you and I will work your last nerve. 
And that way you get to learn the power of forgiveness. And little soul said, oh, you would do that for me? <laughs> and the second angel said, of course I would. I love you. <laughs> but I ask only one thing of you, and that is that somewhere in the meanness and in the unkindness and in the working your last nerve that you remember who I really am. And little soul said, well, I'll try my best. And so the two angels joined hands, and they stepped up to the threshold, and they crossed over into the planet Earth, into the dimension of planet Earth, and the rest is history. Maybe they became Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> the rest is the story of all of us, right? The story of all of us coming from some other dimension and learning how to be the presence of light and love here on this blissful, beautiful place that we call planet Earth that sometimes doesn't seem all that blissful and beautiful while we're in it, right? So I used this story this morning as kind of a preamble to my talk about this book, the one that, that Judy mentioned in, in the reading where everybody giggled, The Top 10 Things Dead People Want to Tell You. Great title by Mike Dooley. And <clears throat> the first thing that he says that dead people want to tell you is that they're not dead. I don't exactly know where his authority comes from from saying that. <laughs> But I believe it. You know, I've done enough memorials and I've had to ponder death and I've been around a lot of death when I was working as a nurse and in my work as a minister. That's one of the, the hazards of, of running a, a spiritual center is that you're with people in, in their darkest moments and their tragedies. And it's a, it's a hazard, but it's a beautiful hazard. You're up against it all the time. And so I've had to think a lot about death. And what I know about nature is that nothing is ever wasted and that energy only transforms. And when you look at the cycle of the life of a butterfly, you know, the, the, the little worm thinks it's, it's not really a worm, but the little caterpillar thinks it's, it's dying when it goes into the chrysalis and then it emerges into something else. And that's such a metaphor for life after death. And I believe that the same thing happens to us, that the dead people the people that we hold in our hearts that have crossed over to the other side have just done that. They have crossed into another dimension. Just as little soul and his friends stepped into this dimension, they have stepped into another dimension. And that they are alive and possibly even more alive than all of us. <laughs> because this guy says that dead people know a lot of stuff and they want to tell us. <laughs> So from this context of the knowing that life is eternal, he goes on to explain kind of how we got here and who we are. He talks about, as Judy mentioned in the reading, how that we are in this, this quote-unquote reality of time, space, and matter, but this reality is an illusion. We are hypnotized by time, space, and matter. Prior to the emergence of time, space, and matter, there is this greater reality that supersedes time, space, and matter, and that matter is pure awareness. He says, some people call it God, but don't call it God yet, because it's too easy to slap a personality onto God that looks an awful lot like us. <laughs> but God is much bigger than, than who we think we are, and we are much bigger than who we think we are. Because in this reality that supersedes time and space, there was this essence that woke up and said, just like little soul, wow, you know, I know about light and love, and I know about the infinite possibilities of existence, but I want to experience them. And so I will create the, worm of the, the, worm, <laughs> the world of time and space and matter to be able to experience myself in form. We are the sensory mechanisms for spirit. Many of the great religions say this. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our religion, said that God meditated the world into existence. Richard Rohr says that the Christ consciousness arrived at the Big Bang when... <laughs> that God decided that matter mattered, that matter was important. The Sufis talk about being a hidden treasure that longs to be known. God, you saying the word I, I was a hidden treasure that longed to be known. And the Hindus talk about how Brahman, the ground of all being, projected itself into matter in order to forget itself and then experience the joy of discovery. And that's how we got here, that we were and still are part of that groundless, birthless, deathless awareness that is all things, that supersedes all things, that is the source of all things. And at some point, 
it's hard to, it's hard to talk about this without so sounding dualistic and not putting it in terms that our time, space, and matter brains can understand, but at some point, a piece of this awareness woke up and said, wow, I think I'll create a Margaret Owens today. I think I'll create an Amy today. I think I'll create a Robin today, or a Lonnie, or a Suzanne. Something woke up and said, I want to be you. And what he says in this book <laughs> that I find somewhat shocking and somewhat hard to get my brain around, particularly on a bad day, is that spirit wanted to be us, awareness wanted to be us, exactly as we are. With all of our flaws, with all of our features, with all of our weirdness, with all of our wonder, as it said in the affirmation that we did together, with all of the crazy, sexy things that we think of, spirit wanted to be us, exactly who we are. He says in the book, you are what spirit wanted most to be. Really? <laughs> You want it to be this? Really? <laughs> On a bad day? Is it all God or is it not all God? Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Rick says, so it must be true. <laughs> it's all God. It's all God. Now, hearing that spirit wanted to be us exactly as we all are may make some people want to give up. Some people, some people may want to, may feel like it's offensive. Some people may want to stomp out of the church and say she doesn't know what she's talking about or that book is a bunch of you know what. But I'm bringing it up this morning in the hope that it's a comfort. In that, in the bigger picture of our lives, the things that we stress over and fret over, whether, whether it's death or adversity or some type of challenge or lack or illness, all of those things are part of this divine miracle of wholeness and all of those things are embedded and embodied in a beautiful perfection that is beyond our knowing. However, it's beyond our knowing now. Let me rephrase that. We can wake up to a greater knowing of who we are through this small shift in perspective of recognizing that who we are right now is absolutely perfect in its imperfection as part of wholeness. Let me explain a little bit more what I mean about that. There's one thing that he says in this book, and, and I think it's just the way he says it. I don't think he exactly means to say it this way, but I don't totally agree with it. He talks about how because it is done unto us as we believe, that's a basic tenet of new thought philosophy, that we create our experience through our beliefs, or the quality of our belief expects the, uh, in, influences the quality of our experience. He says that death is probably what you think it's going to be. So if you believe that the pearly gates are going to swing wide and Jesus is going to come strolling out like a drag queen. <laughs> uh, it was very, very drag queen choreography, I thought. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> backing up. If that's what you think death is going to be, then that's what death will be for you. If you're expecting to meet the Buddha, then you'll meet the Buddha. If you're expecting to see the whole pantheon of Hindu gods, you'll see them. If you expect that it's going to be hellfire and brimstone and you're going to be judged, then you'll have the experience of being judged. And I believe that to a certain extent, except I also know that there is a reality beyond what we know, beyond the limitations of our current knowing that is so much better than we could possibly imagine. And I say this because, you know, thinking back in times of history when we thought that certain things didn't exist, you, know, you probably learned in elementary school, like me, that there was a time pre-Columbus when people thought that the world was flat and that the sun moved around the world, right? And they all believed that, and that was truth, and that was real, and that was the way it was, and it influenced their behavior, and then there couldn't be anything other than that. Meanwhile, the earth and the sun are there like, whatever. <laughs> They're just doing their thing. <laughs> there are realities that exist whether or not we believe in them. And that brings me to this reality of this thing that we call death or life after life. You know, probably many of you have read Proof of Heaven by Eben Alexander, who was a, a uh, neurosurgeon that I had the pleasure of working with my first year out of nursing school. I didn't know him well because he was like really cute and sexy and very in crowd and I was not. <laughs> so anyway, but I did, I did speak with him on occasion and I knew that he was a, a, just a really fine upstanding young man, sense of humor, good guy, no reason to write a bogus book about life after death. But he also was what I would say somewhat of a 
typical <laughs> neurosurgeon in that he was very much into the idea that the brain, the functioning brain, creates everything. That all of our reactions, all of our thoughts, all of our consciousness is a product of brain cells, brain activity. And then Dr. Alexander went into a coma and had an afterlife experience that was anything that he, that was anything but utter darkness. He thought when we died, we would go into utter darkness. He had this vivid experience that he documents in his book. When he came out of the coma, he wrote about it. And he wrote, he looked at his medical chart and he saw from knowing his knowledge of, of neurosurgery that the things that were happening to him could not be explained medically. And from that experience, he realized that there is a consciousness that exists independent of the body. But he didn't believe in that before he went into the coma. And yet it still existed for him. So the point of this is to know, <laughs> to remind us that we don't know everything. <laughs> and yes, our thoughts or our consciousness or our awareness does somewhat create our reality. But really, the seeds of negativity or limitation that we sow are totally superseded by something so much greater, a reality that we cannot even imagine. And so we stay in that place of understanding that there is something greater even than we know and allow that to help us and guide us. How can that knowledge of something greater than we can imagine help us and guide us? I thought about it a lot in terms of our problems, our challenges our problems that seem so riveting and where it seems like there's no solution, where we get so hyper-focused on the problem that that's all we can see. There's a, a saying that one of, my, uh, or one of my husband's spiritual teachers taught him, which is problems yak. I don't know what language that is. Anybody know what language that is? I think it's, uh, I think it's kind of, you know, Middle Eastern something. Anyway, problems yak and came up because we were going to have a yak in our Christmas pageant last year. But anyway, problems yak is, means that there, there is no problem. And I'm, I'm of the mind that there is a problem and there isn't a problem, and both of them are having, having, happening simultaneously, like the glass is half full, like the glass is half empty, like when you're touching your elbow, you're touching your body, but you're not touching your entire body. You can have a problem, but at the same time, it is not a problem. You know, the example that I thought about this, I think because, because it's been in the news so much, is, is around the whole issue of, of sexuality. You know, how many of you have like seen headlines about Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner, and the, the situation that he's going through? And I, I don't mean to min or diminish that for him, her now, D diminish that for her and to, to make it sound like I'm callous or anything, but part of me is also saying, why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? You know, it's like, so you have this, this condition and we have the technology to fix it. Why is it a problem? It's a problem because we make it a problem. We make a whole big drama out of it, right? And the same thing I was thinking, as I was thinking about him, I was thinking about Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres. And, you know, for those of you who have followed her career, you know that when she was doing the Ellen show, she came out and she was one of the first Hollywood actresses to really boldly come out on television and let everybody know, in a very humorous way, by the way. Did anybody see that episode? It was freaking awesome. <laughs> really great television. But it kind of ruined her career for a while, as she says. It ruined her career and nobody liked her anymore because people thought that being gay was a problem. And now much of that has shifted in a large part of the world. Many people, I would assume just about everybody here in this church, understand that being gay in, in the larger perspective that sees everything is just a variation on a theme of sexuality, right? And I, I bring that up just because it's such a good illustration of how we make our problems and they seem so real to us and they seem so compelling to us, and they seem like this is truth, this is reality, but surrounding our problems, there's this whole other perspective that embraces everything. You know, when my nephew came out of the closet, there was a whole gamut of reactions in my family about it. Most, most people were very kind about it and very concerned about, you know, they, they were mainly just upset because they were afraid that maybe he wouldn't have a happy life. And then he married his, his, the man of his dreams 10 years later and we were all crying at the wedding and having a wonderful time. It was a beautiful thing. But it's that same principle is that we are, 
creating our own reactions to our problems. And beyond our reactions, beyond our reactivity, there is this whole beautiful thing, <laughs> like life after life, like awareness, something t more beautiful and more mystical than we can imagine. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And in my father's mansions, there are many closets. <laughs> <laughs> It's from the Bible. <laughs> so how wonderful to talk about uh, Caitlyn Jenner and Ellen DeGeneres and my nephew. And that may not be a challenge that some of us are going through, or maybe you are. But I'm pretty sure people have, have asked me, do you have any closets? Do you have anything that you're ashamed of that you want to keep hidden that feels like it's too much of a secret to share? You know, as open as I am, Person, one of the practitioners asked me that a couple weeks ago. I'm like, I've got closets. I've got closets, right? So what if today, in the perspective of knowing that who you are was chosen by all of everything, and what you are going through right now was also chosen as part of perfection, what if you could hold that perspective and see that, yes, your problems are your problems. They feel awful to the ego. They feel awful to the separate self. They feel awful to the self that wants to survive. But at the same time, there is this whole beautiful perspective that supersedes it, that carries it, and that loves it. And the more that we identify with that greater perspective, the more things shift on the earth plane. The more we are able to see clearly that maybe this thing that we've been holding so tightly will resolve itself if we simply let it go. That maybe this thing that we are gripping and holding onto with our last breath, that maybe there is some place of beauty and goodness and power and love that is intrinsically embedded in this thing. Are you willing to try that? <laughs> I hope so. You know, the beautiful thing about this too is that you don't have to try it if you don't want to. And you don't even have to believe a word I'm saying. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I'll tell you, it takes a lot of the pressure off of me, really. <laughs> no, the reason I say that you don't need to believe a word that I'm saying is, is directly from our founder, Ernest Holmes, where I'll paraphrase him, where he says, I don't give a rat's fanny. It, he, doesn't, he didn't really say rat's fanny. That's the paraphrasing part. I don't give a rat's fanny if you believe these principles. Please repeat after me. I don't give a rat's fanny if you believe these principles. What I want you to do is to take these... I didn't see everybody see rat's fanny, say rat's fanny, by the way. <laughs> okay. What I want you to do is to take these principles and apply them and prove them. So what would your life be if you dedicated yourself to proving the principle that you are chosen by God to be exactly who you are and that everything that is happening in your life is part of a greater perfection that you may not be able to see in your focus on imperfection. What if you practiced that? What would happen? I'll bet you'd start seeing more perfection. I'll bet you'd start living with greater freedom. I'll bet you would start living with greater abundance and greater joy. You know, a wonderful way to prove this principle too is not by looking forward and not even by staying in the present, but by looking backward. When I studied with Rachel Remen, uh, last October, I went to a seminar for her, and she was talking about how our purposes that have been implanted within us from before we were born, that they start revealing themselves in a very sweet and beautiful and soft and often unnoticeable way from almost the moment that we arrive on planet Earth. And she asked us to look back and see if we could remember when our purposes started revealing ourselves. And I apply that, that idea of looking back to taking a moment to look back into our own lives and see, you know, when I was five, did something happen that supports who I am today? When I was 10, did something happen that supports who I am today? Just picking the first things up, thing, thing that comes up and seeing how it really does fit into what happened today. I tried this yesterday when I was walking on the beach and I thought about when I was five years old, one of my, not my first memory, but my, one of my first memories of sadness. When I was five years old, my mother took me to kindergarten and left me there. <gasps> and I didn't cry, 
I was a little German girl even back then, and I held it in. I was stoic, but I wanted to cry because I felt like my mom was going to leave me for four whole hours. And there were children there that I didn't know, and this scary-looking teacher, and milk and cookies that I didn't taste, and, and, and I didn't know how to act. And that, that sort of, I think, was the beginning of understanding what abandonment and sadness feels like, and rejection even and how that starts to open up, how that starts to crack open the heart for greater compassion for others. And then I thought about when I was in, in fifth grade and what I, something that I learned in fifth grade. The first thing came up that came up for me was when I was in fifth grade, our science teacher, whose name was Miss Stress. <laughs> Is that crazy or what? Miss Stress. <laughs> She read us, she taught us the fact of life, facts of life, but she didn't teach us to us in, in a very usual way. She read us a book about how chickens mate. <laughs> and then after the chicken book was over, she closed it up and she said, and humans are pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and so I remember going to a slumber party with my little, my little 10 year old girlfriend shortly after that, and we were talking about what's the first time gonna be like, and all of us were walking around going, <laughs> And I see how that feeds into this moment right now, how it, how it was the, the burgeoning seeds of sort of a, a rowdy irreverence that doesn't take anything, including sex, which is just so ridiculous when you really stop and think about it, doesn't take any of that too seriously, but knows that God has a sense of humor. I thought about in junior high when I was standing by the, uh, by the, the door in my in my house and it was winter in New York and I had the door open and my father stuck his head and he said, what, are you trying to heat the whole neighborhood? Because the door was open. Anybody hear that when you were growing up? Yeah, so my father who, who had a, a good living and we, we lived in a nice home in a nice neighborhood but he was raised in the depression and so I got to see that balance of scarcity and abundance and how powerful that is now as I'm in the process of, of leading a church or living a life. You know, and, and then I, you know, of course, one of the big memories for me was my mom getting sick when I was 13. She got a very uh, aggressive strain of cancer and she died when I was 17. And going through high school with that shadow hanging over my head, but also the joy of my mom knowing that it was probably the last few years of her life and how joyous she was and how present she was. And so in that experience, I got to learn how to balance sadness and joy and hold darkness and light simultaneously. And what a gift that is for what I am doing now. So I know that if it's true for me, if I can make sense out of learning how chickens mate, <laughs> you can make, <laughs> I heard a snort down here, you can make sense out of everything that's happened to your life, everything that's happened. So if you have some time later on today, if you want to do this, it's a beautiful meditation. Just look, look through your life, pick a year, come up with something that happened, and see how it plays into what is happening right now. You'll see that really, even though you're so, we tend to be so fixated on, on, on the, the challenges that are happening now or the problems that are happening now, everything that happened, whether it was good or bad or ugly or in between, everything that happens is part of this incredible mosaic. You know, and there's this saying that a bumblebee on a Persian rug, on a woven Persian rug with a beautiful design, if it's sitting in the color red, if it's sitting on the rug in the color red, all I can see is red, and it says, ah, the world is red, the world is red, I'm so tired of red, the world is red. But as soon as it spring, spreads its wings and flies up and rises above, it sees, oh my gosh, the world is a beautiful, beautiful pattern, and I missed it because I was so hyper-focused on red. The same thing is true for you. If you look at your life in the past, and see how it has blessed your present. And then start looking in your present and start seeing the gift of what is happening as it is happening. That gives you wings. That causes you to rise above this beautiful mosaic, this beautiful woven Persian rug that is your life. And you can see that really, really, it is so incredibly beautiful. And you are beautiful too. And God chose you to be you exactly as you are. If you really want to get sophisticated with this, you can also apply this to the other people in your life. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to tell them that you're doing it, <laughs> but you can look at people and understand that they are exactly as they are supposed to be. They may even be like that second angel and little soul sent to the planet Earth to work your last nerve so that you could learn forgiveness, 
so that you could learn the boundary of saying a good firm no, to stand in your power, so that you could learn a whole host of wonderful things. But we're all giving to one, or, one another all the time. And really, as I said, when we look at it, it is incredibly powerful and incredibly beautiful, and most of all, incredibly loving. So this morning, I hope that you have woken up just a little bit to the love that you are. I hope that you take these principles and apply them to your life in a, in a deep and a powerful and a personal way, because you deserve an amazing life. Why? Because you are amazing. You are a piece, a place of that beautiful awareness that is birthless and deathless and changeless. You are something that has chosen to be you. You are the magnificence of God, and you are eternal. You are eternal love. Now let's start acting like it, and let's start by knowing that that is who we are. Let us pray. So I turn within to trust and know that there truly is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is the life of all of us. That life is perfect. That life is the perfect beyond what we define as perfection for our human minds are only containing a portion of the infinite right now. Only containing a portion of that which can never be contained. So we stretch our consciousness to a new awareness of the perfection of being, to the perfection of reality, and to the love that is in all things. How good it is to know that we are one with that love, that we are one with that perfection, and that our life unfolds in all of its grace and in all of its trials and triumphs, in all of it, in all of it, there is this bliss and this underlying energy of wholeness and well-being. I abide in that energy of wholeness and well-being now because it is who I am. And as I use the words I am, I am not speaking only of myself, I am speaking of all of us because all of us are the I am presence. So I am abundant, I am powerful, I am the presence of love, I am loving, I am generous, I am compassionate, I am in a place of perfect peace, I am stretched in smiling repose, grinning at the world and grinning at all of the shenanigans that go on in life. I am that place of perfect being, perfect heart, perfect mind, perfect body. I am so grateful to know this truth, so grateful to abide in this truth and to allow it to become part of the fabric of my life. I am grateful that God is guiding each of us in unique and wonderful ways, ways that sometimes show up in disguises, but so much, great, so much more grateful for the trust that God truly is present in everything. I give thanks for this morning. I give thanks for the healing that I know has occurred through the result of our spiritual work together. I trust that healing has occurred. And I trust the ripples of that healing reaching out to bless the entire world. I give thanks for this teaching. I bless all paths to God, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, fundamentalists, atheists. I bless everyone, for everyone is a blessing. And with a heart so filled with love and gratitude, I say thank you, Spirit, thank you, God, thank you so much for our lives. I release these words, and together we say, and so it is.